the exhibition, which was at the end of summer, early fall, great weather. And apologies for not being able to uh, follow through with our promise to Ankara regarding the kind of this was going to be in Ankara. But uh, <clears throat> the weather not, would not uh, permit it in everybody's schedule, and the weather was just not right for that uh, for this time. So we decided to, at the last moment, uh, regroup and, and organize the conversation <clears throat> in Istanbul. So as I said, it's the third of a series of conversations. Uh, the first one was with Ahmed Tökten, who is also the designer of the, uh, helper to design of the exhibition in Istanbul, and also about the graphic work of the exhibition in Istanbul. And, uh, and the correlation is that Ahmed uh, was one of the first artists to meet with Ismail Saray after Ismail and Jenny came back from, uh, from, the, from the UK and they had a long standing uh, friendship and relationship since, and uh, since that time. The second conversation was on arts education that was at South Philadelphia, about the mountain and half ago, with Felicity Allen, NJ Wiener, and Anthony Dudek. And uh, that the, in the panel, that was, uh, and Ismaili was not here at, during, uh, during that time, but uh, the panel brought up many interesting issues, and, and, and I was I mean, particularly indebted to uh, Anthony uh, for his presentation, which opened a new, completely new uh, page for us for regarding, uh, regarding recontextualizing uh, Sarai's work and the time and, uh, and, and the whole context of uh, and journal of art and education and the artist placement group and job uh, What I'd like to do today is invite uh, the progenitors of the uh, project. We don't use the word curator, as you all know here, but we use the uh, our programmers do you think and say the recommendation come and sit with us uh, they're more important than uh, my, my position here uh, at, at this table uh, what we're going to do uh, today come on, come on, come on. Uh, and do you just had an article that came out what last month in Art Margins uh, magazine on a particular work of uh, Ismail Bey. Uh, I hope you have a chance to, yeah, we get a chance to read it. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to hopefully start with Anthony uh, posing some uh, questions and we're going to take it from there. And this talk has been supported by the British Council. So thank you. Hello. Uh, uh, we, we had a few conversations uh, with uh, Jenny and Ismail in, in London to prepare for this talk. Uh, and I have to say, it was wonderfully circular in a way. We, there was so much to say. And uh, we tried to arrive at various structures, and in a way, I think we happily failed. So I don't have actual questions so much as areas of interrogation. And the first one is um, the obvious one that takes off the last conversation, which is education. And I think it would be quite important to hear from Ismail again, and I'm sorry if this is something that's very familiar to you, but it's very interesting to me how um, from the word go, from this degree show at the RCA, uh, and onto his own pedagogical activities, education remains the site really of production, and I think we say this too easily, of uh, production of knowledge. Uh, it doesn't really make much sense, but we said that something is happening in the creative educational act, and where those two really collapse. And so this is almost a semi-biographical question, but it's also one of essential, fundamental line that crosses all your work, which would be basically, how do you occupy the site of education, both of yourself and of others? Well, I look at it, I think, is the way the artist works in general is they, they collect data. In a simplest sense, is the uh, let's say when we are training ourselves, uh, we look at the subject, let's say, and then look at the piece of empty paper, and we try to carry that what we see on the paper. That particular data co co uh, collection is so important. And this traditional approach, of course, over the years changed quite a lot. Data co collection at the end became a kind of a source 
to so complicated changes. Let's say, look at the uh, scenery, let's say, we are looking at the uh, uh, nature, and that particular nature keep moving, how we can collect the, that changing data in the sky, clouds are moving, trees are moving, birds flying, and when we freeze them and put them on a paper, we can put it anywhere we want, because we saw it there, and then I can put from a different corner of the paper. That kind of thing is observation and practice is gave us a freedom and how we physically accurately make those data transfer. If we see a cloud, very tangible uh, object is when we are drawing with a pencil and it is going to be that line of something. And like a, a fuzzy hair, it is okay drawing, but suddenly doors opens and closes and the hair moves. And then shall we write these little details and then redraw? That would, this kind of receiving information, perceiving these information of cognitive understanding of the objects have to be. I really feel this is a have to be uh, taught in the in a very basic sense in the universities or schools or kind of in life in every level. Uh, what is going on surrounding us? Therefore, I really feel very close to every professional person. Whatever they are going to do, they should kind of uh, understand what is surrounding them. If they don't, then at the end, what is going to happen? And so we've got very eclectic, patchy, collaged life, and uh, very complicated, confused state. We don't know where things come in the way. And at the end, of course, the the, the, the statisticians freezes this particular data collection and then collage, not, not collage, but the cover uh, that with a like a chocolate or cream coverage of the, everything and that becomes static understanding. Therefore, uh, artists, I think, would like to see real things. What is this? Uh, theoreticians cover the objects with what we've been practicing. That will, we keep, practitioners keep running away from the theoreticians, but the theoreticians trying to understand and package and present us to the public and in the modern world, let's say since the uh, printing started in the Can I ask what you What was the trajectory here? If you would tell us a bit more in a more kind of a more precise fashion in which we could understand in terms of the historical, historical trajectory as well. You were at Dazi, a particular school. There was a particular system of education there. Then you experienced two different systems of education in London. Yeah. And then you became, and you returned, and you became, you became quote unquote, an educator as well. Why? I mean, that, that, what was, because these are, I mean, yes, I mean, beyond, uh, beyond any notion of subjectivity and subjectization, there's, there was something else going there historically, which was quite uh, powerful. I really went into, uh, Let's say I wanted to do art, but I found a gap in economical context at that time in the structure of Turkish education system. Is I found myself in Gazi and joined two things together. And in there, 
I was given one guidance. You are going to be a teacher to teach other people how to teach. It's a kind of a, it is not a somersaulting once, but somersaulting three times to show people how to do it and what not to do it. Therefore, Gazi in that sense is very important point. And I found a kind of a, this particular task. And that responsibility went still goes on with me. And I look at the artwork and I'm not <coughs> quite uh, giving an account of what I do to every artist say, what does your painting describe or what does your work describe? Could you tell us? Some of the artists says, well, I've done everything that tells you everything. Therefore, if you can't understand, that's your problem. That kind of attitude. And I don't follow that. And I get excited if somebody asks about my work. And I say, watch, during that time, while I was making, I thought these things. But now, it might be talking to me differently. What do you think yourself now? You are looking at this particular artwork first time, and then must be telling you something different now than if you had seen this work 10 years ago or a few years ago. And therefore, I look at the educational thing, and that's so important in terms of the understanding of the world, data collection, bringing these elements. And artist's responsibility in life also, which is not kind of, we are not living in a cage, gilded cage, which some artists would like to live uh, happily, or that commissioned uh, some of the Renaissance artists. They, of course, they hit their wings against the cage. It hurts them, you know. It is very suffering. They, to themselves, so to get, their intention wasn't getting out of the cage, but they, they are happy to produce goods or the things he wanted or the other people. But education in that sense, what I feel, is a core. And I'm not quite sure what the, today's uh, education in Europe, art education, and today's art education in Turkey, this will bring to us, and I very much would like to see these issues coming up to surface. The responsibilities of the new generation of uh, lecturers, teachers, and I think um, what they are able to contribute to the world, I think, in terms of what we see in the outside world, how that transfers into uh, artwork. I need to follow on from that. I mean, the way what's interesting with, with your work is this the reversal of the paradigm. So it speaks to you about yourself, as it seems I've described yourself. And I think that applies at the institutional level. It seems that it is very telling that we are now looking at your work as such, as, as work. Uh, I mean, of course, that hasn't just happened now, but the fact that I've sold and the work of the archive and the research element of this has come out now is really, I think, quite telling. It is a symptom. And so I think that's maybe something to uh, bear in mind or I think to maybe reflect with you on this uh, mirroring between, say, the 1960s and 70s, uh, at least in the UK, where institutions were really reinventing themselves. I think art schools had to be invented in modalities of being. Uh, institutions that showed art became laboratories and then you had the arts labs. Uh, there's a whole number of, uh, in a way, epistemological changes that were reflected not only in the institution itself, but the art was demanding it. In the same way, your art now, I think, very much demands these new responses. And it's interesting to me, and that's maybe something that we could hear more about, uh, about how the institution itself needs to respond to your work. It's not, it cannot be a simple act of display, nor can it be a simple act of transmission of knowledge, but it has to be what the art is actually teaching the institution. I can see uh, your interpretation is uh, very uh, exciting. The, the, how one uh, sees in 
how I see myself in the art world. Um, but what I do is still needs to be understood with, through <clears throat> the other people. And I learn quite a lot from yourselves, what you see here, because that is what uh, I don't know, I don't see you know, what you see here and effect on you. And we look at the glass from this side and what I see. And when trying to grapple, we can't communicate if we don't participate in discussions, talks, and uh, set the education structures saying, this is how it is, this is what we have to do, let's do it. And then people, if they don't do it, they don't pass the lessons or marks. And we are going to have a tough time on that. And at the end, um, new generation of people, I think, is now start to see what is missing in the art education. And uh, probably that, that is what we have to just throw everything into the air. But uh, that is what I think maybe this particular uh, archiving uh, uh, process brought certain aspects into the, into the uh, everyone's uh, view. Maybe I'll just do this so we can pass it on easier. Um, it was a challenge, and um, yeah, it is a learning experience from the point of view of the institution of how to present the work of an artist in this manner. And I think that's why we went for a really complicated um, archival process, as well as, I mean, one part was the physical research and actually what works we could find. Um, what things survive, and also a discussion about what it means to recreate some of the works, even though they're conceptual works, and there are clear instructions on how to make them, and it doesn't matter if it's material from 20 years ago or if it's now, as long as it's done with the artist's um, permission and oversight, but we tried to steer clear of um, doing a lot of reconstructions and wanted to stick to the works that we could find, and the works that explain key moments um, and we realized just showing the works was not enough. I think that was a big and that's why it became a more of an archival uh, project than a display of artworks. Um, maybe Susan can say more about the archival process side. The archive, when we started to work with the archive first we needed to know the artist's life. We had no information about his life, his work, and uh, to be able to uh, arrange the archive, we had to uh, create his biography first. And you know, on the other hand, the artworks most of them are not remain anymore. And uh, in the project, the archive and artworks, and also the memory, all of these three, uh, these uh, these became a supplementary part of each other. We can ask you what you what you thought of the way that we I and mean, you were part of it. You were uh, part of the preparation period. But how did you find? Because you're talking about the reading of the work switching uh, as as it goes as time passes by, and the way that we presented your work was quite contextualized. Depend depended on your biography, but it also expanded on to. The education system in Turkey in the in the seventies, what was happening politically uh, as you reached closer to the eighties, and what pushed you to go back to London. So all of these things became like sort of started surrounding the work. So it's, I think in our presentation, it was hard to read the work just on its own, but it was enmeshed with all of these other stories that came through the political and the historical, and also your biographical. So. It was a completely different presentation than perhaps how you intended the works in the first place. So I'm really curious what you thought. Well, uh, I, I think someone's life is like, a, uh, I'm not going to say there's a kind of a one sheet of paper and chopped at the beginning and then call it collage together later on. But uh, I think uh, and, uh, where one 
is coming from is uh, education wise and uh, growing up in one community and becoming a professional animal going to the university and studying certain things and breaking one's life education breaks life as well people travel place to place to find a suitable different uh, mm -hmm. kind of uh, institutions and when i started back teaching again in samson and that life broken and i wasn't my wife in working in uh, istanbul i was in samson that kind of a uh, experience how we would like to bring things together to make more impact possible and then later on, that life is broken again. I had no other choice to leave Turkey and uh, because of the conditions then. Uh, again, these fragmented positions, uh, every work of art I produced or every thing I done during that time appeared to be not related. But when yourselves is looked at all the documents and then clearly I think so so wonderful dynamic uh, group of people who were participating collating these informations surrounding me and they knew every detail that is so exciting they said so no 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 it is that date that time and everything was for those people and I I wasn't in life in the examination but uh, yourself is collated that you probably should actually put in front of me and I find out this is very important. As soon as I the idea put forward your, by yourselves again uh, with Ahmed, I think, is the how it's everything is going to be make more sense if we put everything chronologically. That full like a beads maybe but made a sense um, to me as well what happened to me and I was able to see the relation and how some of the works is being started somewhere and reborn or reinterpreted in another form and some of the elements in the other uh, works. Therefore, I felt really very comfortable the way they, these things at the rock library again, like, uh, uh, every work with the missing bits still made a sense. And then you mentioned some of the uh, works can be reproduced. That I said, oh, well, oh, it's not necessary. Is it necessary? And then the size of the project, I think, right at the top floor. And that, I said, oh, if it can be made, it will be a great idea to do it. But doing that, and I think uh, tidied up everything, is again, brought back to the top floor education. And I did in St. Martin's that time, brought the top of this building. It's a kind of uh, look like a control, so abstract. In the meantime, intellectual is quite complicated work, but reproduced. That that was, I think, uh, it's I have to be discussed again. I think so. Between us, soon we can discuss what that means. Therefore, we were working in that kind of uh, collective uh, process, which we presented to the other people, the visitors. In a way, the, this documentation. I hope, uh, as far as I know, it made quite a good sense, in my place, to uh, some of the people which they can see works makes more sense if evidence is being surrounding them. And therefore, it, uh, it created a better, uh, clearer understanding. Just, just a, I mean, just to go. I mean, to, I mean, I mean, maybe we go back to Anthony's question again. Just to 
uh, to kind of explain the background a little bit, perhaps with we were working on another project uh, three years before that, and 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 uh, we did resort to making um, working work making work uh, again after uh, the artist uh, had had passed away. And although I mean I was extremely intimate with the artist and knew exactly the steps he took uh, during the production of that work, uh, that the making the work again or actually completing the work or or, or it, was, it was it was quite problematic. And I think with with uh, with this project, uh, it doesn't matter if the artist is around or not. Actually, making the work again is. Is, is a problematic there's a and there's a, there's a problematic there which is yet to be which is yet to be resolved actually the I mean of course the you know the work upstairs was was also a performative action it was labor you know taking apart the size of and then all of that is uh, allows for a reconstruction although we did you know we did not uh, no work that was destroyed was completely remade in this in this project they, 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 we shied away we shied away from that and i had a little bit of unease with the exhibition from the first moment on is is that somehow to me it, it looks uh, which we discuss always between us is that it, it it seemed to lack some resolve on its part that is to say to to have it as kind of an overarching sentence or or a position rather. you know the position was described perhaps through the works themselves it was a continuous it's very good, seamless uh, narrative, but there is no. Uh, it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't reading as if you know there weren't front moments and back moments. It didn't have that kind of ecology. It was very. It was going like this, you know. And uh, but at that, at the same time, uh, as you say, I mean, it's how to how to rethink through this without making without inventing that moment. And then in Ankara, we did it completely different installation. Which foregrounded the monument as opposed to the document, you know, the uh, object, which is also um, in and of itself is a, is produces a particular kind of uh, def deficiency because it wasn't, I guess, it wasn't the works or uh, it was the whole story that you, you you two were after, not did not this object or that object, but the whole story. So that that whole when you do that whole story, there's a particular. Um, uh, flattening of the difference between the document and the monument, between the story and the object, between this and that, which is, which I guess is understandable. Coming back to Anthony, to your to, to your question, um, what was your reaction to the exhibition in, in, in that sense? I mean, how did you? I mean, because you asked this question with a particular conceit, I think. Uh, I'm just that's one question. Secondly, uh, when you were here last, you talked about N magazine. Uh, and, and quite a bit, and you kind of framed it in a position where it was repositioning the 70s and the 80s uh, with some force, and we were just bring it back, and that was also very, uh, um, that fact was uh, kind of unsettling and quite interesting, and, and that you had not uh, known that, uh, known about that before, or, or you hadn't crossed your uh, trajectory, although you are a you know, you're a historian of exhibitions too. Maybe we could answer those questions as we go along because I, I had one response to what you were saying about the archive, which may also have to answer some of what you were saying. Uh, and in a way, what appeared to be very successful in the show, which doesn't come through in what you were saying, was this uh, you know, the partiality of the, the archive. I mean, I find quite interesting is this, again these mirror these mirror games between the institution and the archive that uh, institutes it. In a way. I mean, an institution depends on an archive, uh, and here this amazing archive, you know, the, you know, the bank has its own vaults that, in a way, it can sit on uh, ideologically and historically, and in a way, this this failed to me uh, quite spectacularly and very exciting way. That is, it was almost an exhibition trying to produce an archive. Um, or visualize or illustrate an archive on which a future story or a story can sit in a way. The, the sitting was quite wobbly, and uh, that was what to me was very exciting. Not that it would say simply, we need more stories or we need a better archive, but that in a way, 
um, you're looking at a counter archival project in the first part. And so if the artist was able, as you mentioned, so I, I, I didn't want to hide uh, my source of how I artists uh, things. And if there's somebody, somebody the artist paints uh, one someone's portrait and that particular person walks in, makes stands next to the portrait, and that is the kind of thing I really like to see, the reality coming out of it and the source of the inspiration, source of the agony, pain, shouldn't be hidden. I think the artists uh, create a curios curiosity and the mystery around those things. Van Gogh cut his ear, I mean, it is important. Maybe he didn't cut his ear, somebody else cut it. I mean, Paul did it, you know. And there's no evidence on that. And the two people's behavior comes to surface. We, we don't know how to handle it. But if artist says, this is the evidence, this is what happens, these are the things motivated me genuinely, and I'm not going to hide it. This is how I cheated everything. This is how I, at that time, to achieve something. Or this is how I begged or I really fought against. All this sincerity within the archive came as an evidence important. And I'm glad these things have been pulled in. Uh, uh, people here working like an army, you know, telephoning, getting more information from different places. And they say, we discovered this, have you seen this, this information? And I said, no, that's very great. It can be included if they really think it just fits into the overall thing. Now, but I, I had nothing there to say, no, 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 please don't put on all. It is going to ruin all my life, all my understanding. Well, this concept of making art is going to be distorted now. Everyone is going to misunderstand me. But I didn't have that kind of problems. My, I didn't have that pressure on the collector's concept either. I didn't have any artwork sold exactly in life, except one, or mm -hmm. by the state. And that kind of thing, there were, I wasn't manipulated for a different kind of life either. People may say, oh, no, 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 don't, please don't tell these stories relating to the artwork. Hangs in their living room, you know, but, or stand somewhere. The, the works, and I think coming to with that kind of evidence surrounding that is that only one thing stands out in my mind to say one Kurdish woman is being take going with her old traditional clothing like a uh, village woman by the two Turkish soldiers taking taking them a man didn't know what to do with a woman should they handcuff should they they were quite a little bit tough. I saw that photograph, a tiny photograph, so I think it's, it's just inspirational. I said to myself, you know, it's just interesting. These are young, uh, maybe grandchildren of this woman taking her, for whatever the reason, into a uh, room, into the world. That kind of evidence, lots of people might have hide. And I separated that soldier from that, put it into the society. And that particular soldier's plain, straightforward, any of us, what could that be, that soldier? In the real world, what is the position of this evidence in the art? And how this evidence can be presented in the archive, it is very important. And you did it, I mean, you put it there, and I saw it, I am really pleased. Because lots of people just sort of don't show my source. They can really harass the archivists in this and, and give a pain. But I was glad these things is being being pulled out. And then new generation of people can feel free to disclose anything they know without hiding. 
that, that kind of uh, energy is that I was able to see in the archive. That is what I learned, what that uh, display said I had downstairs. That, therefore, it is quite a positive approach, I think. And I know, so the way you raise the issues is that, that duality of the uh, returning semi exhibitions uh, and helping the archive, archive helping the exhibition is, a, is a kind of like enhancing each other's. And I think it's a, I see that as an installation. That, that's good to see it, that kind of thing. Yeah. It gets very suspiciously close to fiction. You know? It sounds like, in a way, you're, you're pleased because you've transformed the archivist from the soldier of objectivity into an artist, in a way. And there's this possibility of interpreting what wasn't there, which automatically makes it a form of almost, um, you can almost compare it to the, mystic, the mysticist in a kind of religious term. You're really reading so much between the lines that you're creating these very impressive, solid, Really institutionally worthy fictions, which I think you make it only please you, and I think justly so. It pleased me as a spectator. I'm too excited by this idea that an archive doesn't need the truth to be truthful, and that it actually can create it as it's going along in this collection of data, the data collection that, that you mentioned. And that I have to say, I hadn't seen it. wasn't referring to something like the tree that you described. It was actually capturing the winds or you know, those images you know, that you showed. But there's one thing that struck a discordant note, and that's the magazine. It, is, it seemed that the magazine itself was doing that. It was a kind of politicized contemporary archiving process of trying to collect non-political views on really extremely urgent political um, debates uh, on education, on access to culture, on, uh, I mean, there's especially some really exciting moments on transnational exchange, all these things that were so important. You know, in the 80s, you were touching these whole moments of the centrist uh, moment. And so that's where I think the magazine almost opposed the archival impulse. It was saying that we were an archive, and that you can't touch anymore. I think it is, um, I'm happy with some issues of the magazine. It's the magazine is, uh, came out of agony, is uh, looking at it, everybody here, Let's say some people I feel would like to have some water. If I see people might be really would like to have some water, if I nothing comes from them, and then if nothing goes from us to offer them a water, and that is a stupidity. But if we make an attempt from there, uh, from here, a dialogue will start, and then with a magazine we did that coming from a kind of a 80s, 1980s uh, territory, let's say military coup, displacement, arriving the, into the Thatcher's world, right wing, everything has been solved. Water is solved, electricity is solved, telephone is solved, steel is solved. Let's say, what else is left in the world? Is it, Roads, transportations, and other things, you see. Uh, post office sold, telecommunications sold. What is left is not being sold. The Thatcher sold these nationalized resources, and we said education is what's being fiddled there around. And we said we can't sit there quiet, you know, we have to do something about it. And there were so many artists there. With the materials they had, lots of glass. Somebody had a bottle unopened. We thought that's, you know, that's create a communication between those artists. We said we can do that if you open this. I've got glass. Somebody else got something else. We create a platform with a magazine in a shoestring, without advertisement, without grants, and other things like that. It's a kind of, I know it's looks a little bit um, complicated, but that created a platform and lots of people now, and I think if people look at that energy, it's tragic full of that energy. And I've seen uh, last three years that energy 
I mean, that's whatever is happening. But so many things happening, but we can't shape it what to do with that energy. That is, I think, and I'm, as an outsider, I'm not there in, in a way to say, hey, looks like you ought to do this. And I, unless I start to live in Turkey and I make a decision to live in Turkey, then I will have words in it. But I will fight or do anything I can in England or in Europe and EU countries as much as I can not to interfere with the other countries' internal issues, not to interfere with their product of art, products of what they produce. And I think I see that so important. Therefore, how, within, within the context of magazines, is kind of a travel everywhere. But the, it was a, quite a good container and I think reflected the mood of the people there. And I'm not going to say uh, put everybody in check into one container, but it is, and I think that energy will pull itself together sometimes as much as we start to talk to each other. Thank you. You're a great person, but I was really first, I mean, I started out in a way with a problem. Uh, the research which was around the artist placement group. Artist placement group, APG, uh, this association of artists in the UK, defied what we understood as political organization. I mean, the word members, they still failed to have a group that identifies them. There was a lot of strife. In fact, there was really dissent by working together. And that's something that I had, I couldn't find a translation for uh, in some kind of post, you know, late 70s uh, language. And I know that Barbara Stavini, the founder of APG, or one of the founders, also has been struggling really since that time uh, to find the kind of method, as you said, to capture that energy or right in it. And I was really amazed, really, in the world when I saw Ange magazine. Because I saw that then you understood, or you, you, you found it in a way, not so much a physical, of course, but also a political vehicle for some of the kind of the tenor of the debates, uh, the violence uh, that was being done, this sort of collectivity, but also not responding in retrograde ideas of what it means to be together or what it means to be a political group or, you know, uh, you know say the unions or there's all these, you know, traditional methods. You are really inventing a new kind of network um, then. And I think uh, the question now, and that's what the exhibition calls, is uh, how to translate something that seems that it demand no translation. I mean, this is the problem. I mean, where and is its own archive, the exhibition is now creating an archive. And the terms seem so urgently contemporary. I mean, that's the, the problem. So in a way, it's, that's the, the question that I was left with. I was fascinated in the last debate, uh, but maybe she was getting actually quite close to something of that intensity uh, in the present. Uh, but I mean, it's something that we're really, I think, looking for. Uh, it's been termed a pedagogical term. It's in terms of a number of things, uh, but uh, that element is missing. And so the exhibition was this insatisfactory reminder or an irritating reminder uh, that we still have to, in a way, translate the untranslatable that was captured in there. So the uh, APG, Artist Placement Group, I think, had a very clear agenda and they wanted to place artists in the industry. And, and the government institutions. And I think that, that is interesting uh, uh, solution. Um, but I looked at it as a kind of um, from completely di different angle, because uh, in, uh, let's say, 60s, 70s, when artist placement group was uh, functioning, um, there wasn't a huge amount of um, kind of, uh, unemployment among the creative people at that time. But what they were saying is they would like to go into the core of things instead of looking at them from distance. That is why it's so good about the APG. They went into the institutions, let's say, uh, National Health Service system, they went into it 
as an artist. They went into the steel industry. They went into the coal industry. They went into the shipping. It is people travel with the cargoes from Japan to England six months with the ship and live like a sailors and the engineers within the ship. That kind of documentation, based on collection physically, it's not looking anymore like in the traditional context of uh, artists looking at the nature and painting on a piece of paper or canvas. But these artists are went and lived and collected that, that data by living in it. Living not like a living like a lord or captain of the ship or captain of the industry, but living like a worker on the floor. They were clearing, sweeping, that's say working in it, as well as looking at them, seeing the hearing the noise and other things. And at the end when they presented the work and the work became so powerful. And they gave a different kind of life to, I think, uh, understand what the, how the artist can produce works. My understanding not of that is that it is, I was coming from that kind of environment, and I, I was uh, you know, brought up in that kind of uh, rural life and the work in doing hands-on things and education exactly the same. Therefore, I saw that that's a natural thing to do. Before you paint the tree, you go and see what kind of tree that and you know, hands on, you get closer to it. APG in that sense, one thing is missing in today's context is artist placement. It's the financing the artist's time. Do you think the artist first should be paid and then do the work later, or they do the work, let's say, a few weeks, a few months, a few years, producing that to the work, and then payment comes later from where it's going to come from, and how much that should be. These are the things, and I discussed with the, uh, John Latham, with Jenny, and myself, you said, hey, you said, watch, we have to sort it out these days. It's a, you can't just go into the industry because you will be kept by the door always. You can't be in it. You have to talk to the trade unions as, a, as well as the management of the organization because you are walking into it. My artist placement, my concept of artist placement is uh, naturally happened when I went to army. I done my military service in Sparta. Everywhere smells roses, except the people elected from those places. They smell fat and nasty people. <laughs> but uh, that kind of environment gave me a real insight to the military service, what it means. And I wish every woman in Turkey should go to army as well, as if men have to go. If they are going to go, women should go as well. And I'm really strong. If woman is not going, once some of the national members of the, this society is not going, and one section is going there, I'm not going there either. But, and I think that kind of things, we have to bring logical understanding if we demand. If all the woman says, we want to go to the army, if my boyfriend, my husband, my brother is going to the army. And we have to de demand things in a way. It is not just, not because I'm trying to say to people to move into a militaristic world. On the contrary, we, I'm trying to look in way in each other's how we think the equality comes to surface. Making art in equal terms, we have to get this equal resources, time, and how we can achieve that in the artist placement concept is really um, these are very much discussed. But there are so many unresolved things in it. But the payment of the artist is not concluded; it's still in the air.
much artists should be paid, and who decides that, and what about the expenses of it, and when we should go on a holiday as an artist, do we? Do we have time, or include, should it be included? All these are the things I'm very much now involved in England and Europe in these issues on how artistic rights are about five or six, seven outstanding issues. It is whenever I talk to British, uh, let's say, artists, they don't see any sense in it. The Turkish artists are very much similar. So maybe I'm talking to wrong people as well, you know. But, uh, but they are not coming forward, yes, what are these things? Let's demand these things and then write them on the wall and then get these demands. And uh, I don't know how uh, those things can be achieved. But we go back to the economy again and survive so the artists. A artist placement group said their payment will be percentage <coughs> of exactly what other people are having. That is what is interesting. What is the average pay in this, let's say, room? or in this building or in one, let's say, NHS or National Health Service, if the average pays certain amount, artist is going to be paid during that time that amount. And that kind of solutions they put forward. But if one artist goes into, from one institution to the other one, their salary goes up and down, can they cope with it or not? I don't know. If this is Economical issues can be looked into. It seems to I me mean, quite paradoxical what I just heard because, on, on one hand, you seem to have this kind of a formless drive, which is really quite impressive. You're saying that you, know, you can speak to, say, Brussels, and there is someone, some authority to speak to, as if in a way from the outside. But on the other hand, it seems clear to us, I think. Many of us in the art world is that we're speaking from an inside, which is this kind of globalized, generalized, um, it's often referred to as the precari precarious uh, society that we live in. And I think it was mentioned by Jenny just a while back, this kind of zero hour. We live all more or less by a zero hour contract. I mean, you get your own pension if you want, and good for you. And that, in a way, was a model we could say, roughly speaking, inherited from the arts. I mean, the artist has given a lot to society. One of them is the model of the precarious living condition. And that is what was given uh, very usefully uh, to certain corporate bodies to say that we can live and produce creative work in that condition. And presumably, uh, a typist and cleaner can. I mean, it's, it's kind of generalized. So I, I, I'm just wondering about this tension, which, and I see this, uh, I wanted to mention this, I work in a private foundation in London. In fact, the architecture reminds me of a very modest scale. Has some, uh, you know, reference to this building where right here, you know, this magnificent sort of a kind of uh, you know, bound structure that's then turned over uh, to the creative rules of the research uh, of this building. So I'm just interested in that. It's the foundation, it's the private rules. I think, and this I'm generalizing, so I, I want to be a bit contentious. But thinking about in this paradoxical inside and outside, maybe the middle ground is where we're speaking now, which is this kind of you know, hybrid construct that actually answers a lot to societal needs. But I'm wondering now how valid is this position from which we speak? Because uh, in the way the artist John Latham in his um, precarious life in South London has become a generalized glamorous ambition for a lot of artists. And what's stopping that and this may be one step too far, but something that is the archive. The archive is what might give a home in a way to the artist. Platinum House, where John Lincoln lived in South London, is now an archive primarily. It allows for some kind of survivability of a certain idea. So I'm just troubled, I think, by this idea that you have someone to go to, but in fact, you yourself may be the influence and inspiration for a lot of um, the fluidity of the economies that we live in. I think it's at times moving. That is why I feel the solutions can be always changeable. And if if I am uh, in the APG context, if I'm among the people who are eating, uh, having bread, dipping into water, that kind of environment, our artist is there. 
and artists are you know, the people having tea and cake. Artists should be there as well, which artists is in the sliding scale collecting data and presenting to the general everybody. And then how this data at the end brings the society flow among each other. And I think it has that kind of function. That is how I see it, the APG, Artist Placement Group. Is it makes the world much natural. Well, it doesn't matter, we can be really on the very top conditions as well as uh, comfortable conditions. Therefore, it's uh, archiving thing. If it freezes, if we don't recultivate, look like a handful of wheat. We can freeze that and put it somewhere. It's not going to be cultivated again, different soil, and it grows better maybe than before. But we have to try the ideas like that. I'm not saying I'm the inventor of anything, really. I'm receiving things and maybe putting things in a different way and trying if it fits or if it works in a different soil which this particular understanding of my interpretation of some of the ideas I had uh, throughout the educational structures in the different places. And I came up with different uh, elements which uh, is quite unique, exciting. Therefore, I liked it, I enjoyed it, because the things I've done in the tough times of Turkey, let's say. It is not easy times, and uh, I'm not saying enjoying, but I'm seeing something which never can be done before, because it is being done. Because otherwise, uh, look, uh, we become like a normal, um, it's an opposing artist, not analyzing artists, opposing artists. And I think we should be looking at kind of like bringing new searching new ideas, bringing new solutions in that sense. And uh, probably it's, uh, we are going to go and uh, look for more uh, ideas. That is why I would like to see the, uh, from the from Turkish uh, side of the, maybe not Turkish side, Anatolian side of the world, the people who are uh, producing works, seeing each other, and I think and I'd like to see people producing works in every half of Anatolia exchanging these works instead of just putting our heads into the same bucket of water. It, it's a, like the stumble is very much like that. Ankara is like that very much. Everyone wants to go into the same area, wants to show something, and then lots of people coming to England as oh I I have a show in England, here it is, or France and other things like that. The issue is not that, but people they haven't seen it anywhere else in the rest of Anatolia. But before anyone see in Turkey, so they are looking at it as showing it somewhere else. And I have that commitment. It comes from the educational structure I was brought in. Because I was I came from Kitaya, went to Ankara, Gazi and then went to Diyarbakir to teach some people who can't speak uh, Turkish because they are uh, speaking Kurdish at all, at wherever they are living on. That, that kind of environment made, made me to understand, wow, oh, there are different worlds, different people going on. Therefore, we have to communicate within that level. We can be stronger, and I think brilliant, committed artists there uh, in this part of the world. And I have seen several works, I think, my, during my visit in South Beirut and uh, I say other galleries in Beirut and here as well in this building. Uh, interesting, exciting works brought in to see other things happening in Middle East and different parts of the world. That is, and I think it's crucial to a little bit more stretching the boundaries. It's kind of good, I feel, it's a kind of excitement essence. So, yeah.
So maybe we can support the old school to ask questions. Yeah. Yeah, I think just one last, just to say that the uh, Israel had proposed a title for this talk. Uh, um, it, was, it was for the master for the horse. And, uh, maybe it, it could be, before we just open up the questions, it would be really good for you to remind us. It's, I think it, the title relates very much to what you just said about uh, this relationship between assembly and curriculum. So, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, when we did the, uh, we wanted to do the magazine, uh, and I, I've been working in a kind of class difference, uh, and also people who work. And they are tools, and I look at it always is there. And I have written really very heavy, um, complicated, huge experience accumulated um, in charity that time. And then I came out and all this experience and then put it into that article, observing the Britain's complexity and the sell off uh, every nationalized industries. And uh, the, that was, uh, let's say, 80s, early 80s, before uh, 1984. We produced the magazine in 1983. 82 was the discussion period. And 83 magazine was ready. We said, why? But we produced it on 1984, or well, we um, little, you know, it's a little bit more. Could be another point where you started something. That time, I had pulled in all those informations into that particular article. Uh, it, we discussed uh, every contributor, uh, the editors involved should put something in instead of editorial uh, guideline. We introduce ourselves, what we are, with putting our own works in it, not in the rest of the magazines. But uh, it, it would be quite a good idea to do that. And then we, therefore, I poured it in. Illustration on that, and I used, uh, I made an artwork, uh, two buckets of water, Put it on a stall, just a dishwasher bucket, and uh, one of them is hot. I call that for the master at any uh, The other one is uh, another, exactly the same bowl. It's uh, cold water for the hot hot kitchen. It's a kind of a metaphor. Art has, uh, let's say, art has, let's say, the uh, horse has um, that's a kind of a different meaning, different cultures. But in reality, art, uh, let's say, the horse was carrying the FND or master. Therefore, when they have to rest, they, they were treated by people in a different way. Master had to wash himself with a hot, clean water to tidy up, and the horse had to carry the master, you know, thirsty, giving out really nice cool water. That kind of um, metaphor I use. Therefore, it is a very basic way of looking at it. It's somehow it could kind of uh, blend somehow. So maybe the Eastern Sufi thinking to the Western world dialogue. Because in England, it's the, you know, horses are always is the top of everything. It's in a way, even the queen goes to the horse races and bets with her own money. But that kind of thing. So she rides a horse sideways, by the way. <laughs> and uh, and uh, that kind of environment that I thought it is important to mention those things you see in that particular work. It's a, it is quite an um, interesting illustration. It has not been exhibited, but it has been used to illustrate the, that particular work, illustrate the, uh, what I have written that time in the first issue. Mm -hmm. So, Inspire, any questions? Yeah, I have a 
I want to ask you about this dissolution that you have with an archive and what it can do because it seems like you're talking about creating this energy of a moment and that you can't do it through just a presentation of an archive or not with and only but also within the whole exhibition you're quite skeptical of trying to come up with a narrative and I'm wondering what's the dissolution that with that because I thought it's also important yes it, it is half fiction and half uh, truth and I think you can you can say that about almost anything. Um, but I also also thought about that the exhibition as kind of returning a figure back into a history that it was pushed out of. And I'm wondering why you think that's not as important as recreating the energy of a moment. Like also with the John Leatham example you gave, you thought about that as kind of creating this figure, but also pacifying that figure through presenting it as an institutional archive. I'm wondering if you have a solution or if you have a better idea of how to do it and why do you think that's a, that is a failed uh, attempt? Uh, yeah, I, I meant it in a very positive way, I have to say. I mean, to me, a very successful archival show, I mean, there, there are possibilities. I mean, I mean, I think of so many great archival Exhibitions. I mean, I remember a Courbet show I mean, not too long ago. I mean, where you know some of you have notes that precede paintings, and you know a lot of sense makes sense, but it makes sense in this kind of traditional um, research uh, research driven way, which is you know you have the object and you seek its you seek to evidence it uh, through uh, paratexts, you know, what surrounds it. When <clears throat> all you have is paratexts, uh, as in the case here, I mean, you only have supporting material exactly in this case of the illustration. I mean, the, the work of art existed only for that, in a way. It was an image. Uh, but it can't really come to life since, in a way, it has in for the first issue. I'm just thinking that there's a, um, a limit to what the archive can do, which is very helpful, I think, to the archive itself. And, um, I think it's what happens, in a, in a way, to that archive. So that's why the two modalities, if you want, are just simplifying, but you have the exhibition Married time, which is you know those five weeks or eight weeks, and the traveling potential of exhibitions, and then you have the archival time, which is this infinity of posterity and posthumousness. I mean, it really has to survive the person in order to really become the overarching uh, message that you described. So, when these two come together, it's usually unfortunately, and I think here all the more since the you know the living pivot was very much there, in fact, validating it. I think your, your validation was even more troubling, could have been more troubling than your refusal, because you were saying that, why not, in a way, to things. You were actually saying, that's a good idea, or, oh, I hadn't thought of that, or, in a way, those are non-archival responses, as opposed to, that couldn't have happened, and that's a wrong interpretation of fact. So, I think within that, um, the problematic encounter of those two modalities, you have a very exciting moment when you have to think of a new time space uh, for that material. And it's neither the exhibition, which demands these prosthetic devices of your creations, nor is it the simple putting into uh, the tape that in London, for example, and making it available for everyone, for the nation, forever. So between those two, uh, since what I'm seeing is quite exciting but very problematic is the institution like SOLT, uh, which is this amazing space of research. It's research-driven, uh, it's supposed to art-driven, but it blurs, it, it, as you mentioned, if the curator word is banned, we're left with uh, we're all producers of some kind of stories. And so that's where these stories are allowed to live for the moment. And those are very precarious. Again, I find in a way these institutions depend on forces that are economic, that are political, and we're, we're rarely protected, I, I sense, uh, this is the case in London, from what might happen to this material. So at Flatheim House, for example, it's a perpetually unstable archive, which immediately makes it not an archive because it doesn't have any overarching system which to rely. So it's this, the, the paradoxical nature, I guess, of these spaces that I think came across in the show, and I was very excited. It felt really historically, I have to say, flimsy, and uh, it, it felt like the horse boat bucket, you know? It was, or, you know, it was somewhere between the two buckets. It didn't know if it was a master narrative or if it was a marginal narrative of someone that needs to go into the master narrative of history. It sat somewhere between the two. And I have to say that the, the first impression was, okay, then, then what? which I was happy for, but I don't know if um, 
that was shared by people seeing that. It, it could not be considered definitive. I, I have a long difficulty about archiving. Is the shall I? I let's say I bought three different color tubes of paint or paint. They are all different prices. Do you think that is important uh, to include these um, cost of the paint, which amount of I use in the paint? Because one of them thousand pounds paint. The other one, 50 pence paid. You know, this is artists economically, they can't cope with it with a certain things, gold leaf painting everywhere, gold leaf. And there are some artists do that, you know, make it work attractive and those acceptable. Archive is some of the at the background information, some of them is uh, it is not mentioned at all. And did what kind of uh, you know, the room heating arrangement the artist had, freezing cold working environment, or very comfortable hot environment. And these are the things archives miss sometimes. Sometimes They might give hint, but how deep we should go into those things, because they, sometimes these are hidden elements. But I think, so I'm not quite sure, there's a, uh, certain issues can be but I'm interested about uh, what yourselves will say because I bet there are lots of questions that come to your minds. But is the artwork and presentation of it is as complex as it has sounds. Um, uh, I want to go back to the artist placement group and the practice uh, of going into uh, other professions and spending time there, six months in the ship working, artists working as, this reminded me of the more kind of 70s leftist activist practice of actually joining the proletariat or joining and being part with them. So, uh, and in a way, throughout the 80s and 90s, there's this thing called Mahalle Dan Meydana, there's this retreat of the left uh, from the, uh, going into the neighborhood, going into the factories, into just Taksim Square for May 1st, right? So it became just a spectacular activity rather than a really organizing activity. So in a way, that sort of, that practice of, uh, this sort of artistic practice of uh, placing, or is this an artistic practice? I'm not so sure, so that's a question or is an activist practice, uh, is a kind of a communist statement also against the mental manual labor division, right? It's breaking that. Uh, so when uh, when you go into, when you, when you were placing an artist, is there an expectation that the artist also functions in other ways than just being one of them, right? For, for instance, sort of talking about Lenin's sort of revolutionary theory or imperialism or, so, or something else. So what's the nature of that placement? <laughs> it's a lot issue. Well, um, I can answer as an artist, but as a, as a I don't know. Okay. But I just want to introduce one term that comes from John Layton that address the, the incidental person. So it was not at all joining the ranks of anyone, be it the proletariat or the corporate class. It was very much retaining the identity of this individual that at first was not even the artist, eventually APG allowed the idea of an artist to emerge, but it was this incidental person that comes in and can't go out. I think that was the novelty, I think, of seeing, and of course from the left it's been attacked very easily. You can say, well, actually that's a complete compromise and uh, a sellout. But APG was, I think, quite courageous in its early days to say that uh, the artist has a right, actually, to trouble systems uh, from both within and without. Uh, so, and I have to say that may be a very productive view on uh, Ismail's work. Well, uh, I, the, I, I think it's a wonderful thing, it's the freedom of uh, uh, artists and uh, how they find the evidence and use that evidence in the form of aesthetic values. And I think that's why APG is there. But, the 60s brought much earlier as well. And the type of, let's say, look at the Dadaists and other things, it's a reaction, so many other historical elements in it. I don't want to go into that 
much back. But what the 60s had is a disturbances within the movement, within the creative people, I said, and also youth movement, and after the war, 60s heavily is the Americans' domination of the Vietnam War and the Red Scare issues and other things like that. It's a Cuban issues and other things going on. From those things, we thought, instead of somebody telling us, the, you know, on the papers and private papers, and the artist has their views, they would like to go into the core of things. In England, military service is 60s disappeared as well, middle of 60s. That's another interesting point. Those people didn't go anymore. Men didn't go to the uh, military service. They stayed out. They thought they can't say no to military intervention to the other countries in that sense. Therefore, production of, uh, if we say no, means do you know anything about something? We don't know. We ought to go into those positions to collect information and produce things. Uh, going into the steel industry and wanting in the steel industry, and I think uh, artists are is quite aware of the, it wasn't just kind of a steel comes out. Steel is hot. Steel factories are hot places, and steel factories are huge, noisy places. But in the painting, you don't see those things. And artists at the end came up with these findings to give a feeling of those people who never had such an experience. Their parents come home with the cold, black faces, you know. You know, it's a hand flag and everything, so they go and wash and dress up nicely clean, white t-shirt and go to the pub. It's just that kind of environment. Therefore, how artists can participate, which side of the story they should, let's say, paint the, let's say, um, minor, black father coming home like that, or dressed up father with a white shirt and other things like that. You see, they want to go into where the things happening to collect the information. And I think it wasn't uh, ra radicalism. Yes, there are symbolic elements in, within the um, socialist movements. Let's go to the factories and the lunch breaks. Let's play theater and other things. Yeah, but it, it is some workplaces can accommodate that, some workplaces can't. Some, in the middle of a football match, you can't stop it. Excuse me, that's, you know, I'm going to be stopping, the, as an artist, stopping the football match in the middle of that and do, do something, paint something or produce a performance. And therefore, every issue has to be looked at individually. That's what's so exciting about it. And, uh, that boy said, I keep that in mind, is the it's a kind of futuristic approach was part of not to intervene other people's businesses by force, but arranging and some kind of drawing up a, some kind of new rules which artists can be employed free. I think that was the main uh, issue. I guess just to, I mean, to add to that, perhaps, I mean, there's a whole legacy and a history of artists being placed in uh, in different contexts in extraordinary times, such as war, that they were, you know, WPA, uh, states, there were Soviet experiments, and there's, there's, a, there's a lot of that. And, and in, in Turkey as well, I mean, it wasn't only the artists that were going to uh, to the countryside to paint the local colors, etc., etc., but they were also going there to uh, to draw the factories and photograph uh, the new sugar factory, which was you know, that was that would be built, and I said, I mean, there's a whole, I mean, that's uh, that's kind of a partial role, which is a which is apparently a, a role a role that you would describe as kind of a workforce, you know, uh, and then as as a result of that work, you come back to the center, home, wherever it may be, you 
present uh, you, rep you present your representations of sorts. You know, I mean that's your role, and you usually present it to the uh, you know to the bourgeoisie, to this, to this, back to the system. It's a, it's a way of feeding and securing the system. That's so it's, you know, it feels good at the end. But but my question with all of this is that. I mean, why do you start with the pre? And it's kind of strange understanding that art has anything to do with work. That that it can somehow be kind of quantified as such, you know. Okay. And that was <clears throat> <laughs> maybe when the APG opened up, I think, because they were allowed and paid to do nothing. I mean, that was the so they were allowed to quantify not doing. And I think that's what really differentiates these histories from was there was a inaugurating a new class of creative <coughs> agents which had only to be creative, but that creativity could take a, a, a non form, which has always been derided. And of course we always I mean, like the traditional trope of the um, you know the lazy the lazy creative, I don't know what, the, the non productive agent of the artist was really confronted there by saying that actually you have to remunerate uh, apparent not doing and that, that doing has to take different forms. Um, I mean, I just think it's quite interesting in APG, and I, I, it's really APG in relation to this matter, because I think it's good to remember the history that one of the first placements was at the steel mill by, by Gordon Levins, and uh, that immediately focused on education. It was how to form uh, these apprentices in, in welding steel when within three years, and it was apparent already by the end of the 60s, that the steel industry was disappearing. So, you know, it's already this, you know, this ridiculous, uh, uh, futile task of traditional education applied to a disappearing uh, material, uh, there's a disappearing class. The, the working class in those terms was about to go and would have disappeared absolutely under under Thatcher, you could say. And the, one of the final placements uh, by Stuart Grizzly was actually the creation of an archive. So in both cases, you understand this prescience of, an, of a group that was really trying to quantify and qualify the artist's work. And creating an archive, creating a memory, was seen by Stuart Grizzly in the late 70s as, as really a creative act that deserved the, quali the qualifier of labor. So I think in Ismail's case, it's maybe a question of those strategies, but applied to maybe the um, more complete disappearance of the understanding of, of work as such. I think that's what really is, you know, the blending, this progressive blending of creativity and work uh, may have just uh, exhausted the, the labor. I mean, this is, I mean, I'm thinking out loud, but there's something about what I saw in the show and what you were doing that through education you could maybe reconstitute an idea of work uh, that could demand its own forms of remuneration, which could be mostly and could be financial, but has other forms of uh, retribution. Uh, and I think that's what's at stake, uh, what I saw at stake a, a lot in, in the work uh, that I saw here. That is what you do in the absence of work, in a way. And you know, how do you fill that gap? Uh, and how do you remunerate? How do you identify it financially, for example? You know, what value systems are applied to this disappearing notion? I don't know if that's accurate. That, that, that's quite uh, clear, I think, to me. It's just, uh, what I look at it also is the um, what happens to the, let's say, uh, any, any person's finishing the fine arts course as a painter, sculptor, any, any other medium, uh, when they finish the course, they find themselves in the street. Let's say, just let's say, look at the academy here. And uh, when I finish, let's say, this college in academy, and uh, I'm outside of that particular door, and then what happens? Where do I go from there? And this particular scheme is being worked on quite a long time by lots of different artists, all the time, still going on. APG was part of our displacement group, it's part of that kind of solution to look at the artists going into the industry without any preconceived idea. That was incidental person usually comes in. Without thinking first, I'm going to do this and this. There's no preconceived ideas involved. That is what's so exciting about it. And uh, still we haven't solved it. And in which way we can create new solutions in, let's say, in Turkey or Europe, England or America or other countries. 
and we have to bring different solutions for those people. Uh, goats aren't come out from the academies into the real world. What is their function? Are they going to be just kind of a survive, float, and disappear, or few of them can survive? And I think it is uh, that have to be answered. And I feel, and also I have very clear kind of better way of working on the, under maybe certain circumstances and rules that there are in a European level we can if we work and that there are solutions it will be to kind of uh, bring solutions to that. But uh, I think you have uh, tough years ahead of you and educators, people working in the education and also the students within it and they have to be accountable what they are in, what they would like to be. And uh, this thing is, um, is going to stay in the agenda for a long time until we uh, get together and uh, find a solution. It's funny that you said earlier about the, the triple somersault. I mean, I find that a very good image, you know, to find out what to do, basically. I mean, if you're teaching teachers, you're already at this kind of middle level of non-production where you're producing producers. And I, I think that's that position that you really uh, charted in a way, which is a really interesting one, which is maybe uh, a bit too close to comfort to the curator or the archivist. I mean, maybe, maybe we're all in that space of you know, relying on other people's labor in a way or, or informing other people's labor. So I think it's an interesting, I think I, it, I, think I don't want to speak too quickly, but there's some the sense that you speak very effectively, your work effectively challenges the institution because you can, and that was the APG dilemma, you know, can it, is it allowed in time to speak the institutional language without corrupting, you know, what was seen as the uh, pure language of the art maker. So by the triple somersault really problematizes that, that you're taking part in the language of those who produce producers. Any other, any questions, any concerns? And I think there are lots of things, but maybe if people not be able to articulate it, maybe in, in English, they, they can ask in Turkish, which uh, I think so it's possible to do that, and then we can respond to that. And I know the language issues is, uh, is, is always a problem. Or we can just turn off the microphones and, and, and keep on conversing here. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, my Bay. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Louis. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, anybody wants to say a few words later on? Have a chat with